What we'll do tonight is take up uh, our study of John by looking at uh, John himself. I think most of us all know that he was the son of Zebedee. I don't know that we remember his mother's name. That was Salome, S-A-L-O-M-E, Mark 10, 35 and 15, verse 40 and Matthew 27, 36. He was um, a cousin, or likely, let's say, uh, a cousin to, to Jesus. We have no way of absolutely knowing that, but you might find it easy or at least interesting to um, look at um, John 19.25. You might want to write that down. And Matthew 27.56. And Mark 15, 40. And compare all three of those. John 19, 25, Matthew 27, verse 56, and Mark 15, 40. The more you study about him, the more it seems that um, he was um, of a family that had some financial means. We conclude that because the scripture tells us they had hired servants. They were involved in the fishing business, Mark 1, 19 through 20. And Salome assisted Jesus and uh, his group, his band, financially, Mark 15, 40 and 41, and Luke 8, verse 3. Uh, they must have had some sort of social prominence because John was personally known by the high priest, John 18 and verse 15. And I think we can conclude from John chapter 19 and verse 27 that he owned his own house. As I said, uh, and as I think all of us know, he was a fisherman as far as his occupation is concerned. Mark 1 verses 19 through 20. And from John chapter 1, 35 through 40, he had been a disciple of John the Baptist. And you'll remember that he and his brother James were nicknamed Sons of Thunder by the Lord himself because they were rather... Uh, hot-tempered, I guess you'd call it, Mark 3 and verse 17. You'll remember that a couple of places didn't want to receive them, so they recommended that the Lord call down fire from heaven and burn them all up. Um, Peter, James, and John were closer to the Lord. We call it usually inner circle of the Lord's apostles. And they enjoyed special opportunities in being with the Lord that the rest of them didn't. You might want to write this down if you compare Mark 5, verse 37 with Matthew chapter 17, beginning verse 1 and the verses following, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 37. It's Mark 5, 37, Matthew 17, 1, verses following. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 37. From John 13 and verse 23, we see revealed that Jesus loved John because of his unswerving loyalty and faithfulness to him. And I think this is typical a lot of times of kin folks and especially mothers as far as their sons are concerned because on one occasion John's mother asked that her boys be given choice positions in Christ's kingdom. John chapter 20 verses 20 through 24. And it was John by himself who stayed with the Lord through the whole ordeal of the trial and his crucifixion. And from the cross, it was Jesus who entrusted the care 
of his mother to John. John 19, 26 through 27. John 19, 26 through 27. I might mention that the song that's written that mentions that, uh, if you don't know about what the scripture actually says, uh, the song doesn't come across quite the way the scripture teaches it. But you might take note of that next time you sing it. In other words, you won't know what the song's talking about if you don't have a proper understanding John 19, 26 through 27. John was one of the first ones to witness the empty tomb of Jesus following his resurrection, of course. John chapter 20, verses 2 through 10. And according to Paul, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, he was considered a pillar in the church in Jerusalem. And leaving the sacred text of the New Testament, what we have is from the so-called church fathers is that his later years was uh, spent in Ephesus. And of course, we know he was uh, exiled to Patmos. The Romans learned that if you kill somebody, there might be a need for that somebody later on, and once they're dead, they're gone. So you can't very well do any good with them then. So they started exiling a lot of folks that were ringleaders, even in their own families, if they considered them to be a threat, the emperors to themselves. So this tends to say, because Patmos is not that far from Asia Minor, and especially the city of Ephesus, and he was exiled then on Patmos, Revelation 1, 9, and 10. And that's where Jesus, of course, through the Spirit, revealed all that we have as the book of Revelation. And in addition to the fourth account, gospel account that John wrote, he authored three what we call general epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And then, as we've already mentioned, he wrote the book of Revelation. And it doesn't end with an S. It's just Revelation. I jokingly will say sometimes Matthew through Revolutions, just to see if anybody's listening. But I've yet to do that, that somebody didn't come back and say, did you say Revolutions? And at least I know they were, were listening. But I think probably... The main thing is, is it doesn't have an S on Revelation. The Greek is apocalypsis. Basically means that which was hidden and now is revealed. He said to have lived, as far as secular records of him, to maybe close to 100 years old and thus outliving all of the other apostles. And... Some think that he was upwards of 90 years old or thereabouts when he wrote the book of Revelation. Jerome, who was one of the so-called church fathers, wrote that when John was old and feeble, he would be carried to the assembly where he would exhort uh, the brethren by saying, my dear children, love one another. Of course, that sounds like in 1 John, well, for that matter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. As to the place and the date of the writing, again, we depend upon um, ancient tradition. And most all of them say he was living in Ephesus when he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the Gospel of John, and he did it in his old age. Somebody, some people think those books were written, and again, it's think so and educated guesses and so forth between 85 and 90. Our oldest that's a, that we found, a uh, New Testament document, is just a papyri fragment from approximately 125 A.D., 
It's called the Rylands Collection. I believe that it is in, uh, I may be getting it mixed up now, but I think it's over in, in Ireland. Um, let's look at the book a little better. And again, we depend on some tradition. It says that John was urged, and I think we mentioned this even in last week, to write this material because he was so old and all the living people were disappearing and the other apostles were already gone. So he wrote down these things uh, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. A work called the Muratorian Fragment. If you study um, the canon, how it was put together, you'll come across what's called the Muratorian Fragment. And uh, it says, and this is the way it's quoted the fourth gospel was written by John, one of the disciples when his fellow disciples and bishops urgently pressed him to do so. Of course, we have no way of, of knowing all of that, but that's what the first few hundred years after the first century has come down to us. But just upon reading the book, you get the purpose of the book. And um, it, of course, parallels to a great extent Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's just not a synoptic book, but it interprets the life, the work, and the teaching of Jesus for the disciples. I've already mentioned that it basically selects witnesses, and all of them are designed to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. I say that he doesn't just relate the life of Christ but that he interprets uh, the Lord's life to us. So you might keep that in mind when you're reading John. Uh, to make believers is what he wrote for. Uh, well, again, we cite John 20, 30, 31 on that. He was then the final inspired man to write again i don't know why and i haven't ever read it after anybody that said they did uh, as to why he did all of this some said well he wanted to put the finishing touches and to fill in some gaps left by matthew mark and luke but we don't know that for sure but I do know that when you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together, you have adequate evidence and credible witnesses to prove to any honest-hearted person, Luke 8, 15, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the way, the truth, the life, that no man comes to the Father but by him, that he is the Messiah. That's the design and purpose of all four of those books. John also is writing so late, heresies that begin to form so he's beginning to deal with some of those. If you look in, well, even if you look in the letter Paul wrote to the Colossians, but especially when John writes 1 John, he's beginning to deal with early forms, as did Paul in Colossians, of what would become Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism taught that matter is inherently evil and only the spirit is good. Serentius, again, you come across these fellows reading in the first 400 years after the first century, but he was a Gnostic, and here's what he said. This is Serentius, and I'm quoting. The world was created not by God, but by a certain power far separated from him and far distant from that power who is over the universe and ignorant of the God who is over all. So 
that basically denied that Jesus came in the flesh. And thus, just read the first chapter of 1 John, or for that matter, the first chapter of John, of the gospel account, and you'll see that he immediately says Jesus was flesh. And that was very important. So he wanted to correct some misapprehensions about even the forerunner of the Christ, John the Mercer. We know from Acts 19, verses 1 through 7, that there were some folks near Ephesus who were still following John later into the first century. That's where we first come across the church in uh, in Ephesus, or not long thereafter. That's where you had people who had listened to Apollos, who knew only the baptism of John the Baptist. And Paul, remember, asked those people, said, uh, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And their answer was, we don't even know whether there is a Holy Spirit. Well, that's all that it took to find out about that, because to be baptized under the Great Commission, one would have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, that told Paul right then by their answer that they hadn't been baptized under the Great Commission, and John's baptism was invalid because it was replaced after Christ's life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, when the church was established with the baptism of Acts 2.38 or Matthew 28. So it also establishes the fact, I might mention this in passing from Acts 19, that you have a right to ask people about the baptism. Paul certainly did. He didn't hesitate to ask them about it. And it tells us that those who tell us they are disciples, that we have authority from God to ask them appropriate questions just to know where they stand or what they believe. Which means also they have a right to ask us those questions too. And if you read uh, the Apostle John in chapter 1, 6 through 8, and verses 19 through 29, chapter 1, 6 through 8, and verses 19 through 29, you will see that the Apostle John stresses, emphasizes, that John the Immerser or the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, true role. He does that also further in John chapter 3, 25 through 30. John 3, 25 through 30. John, the immerser, the forerunner of the Christ, shows that God had come down to man so that man could rise to God. And that kind of idea pervades the whole New Testament of Christ when you see what the writers have to say about Christ and his reconciling men to God by his own body on the cross of Calvary and offering his body as sacrifice and shedding his blood for the remission of sins, or as Acts 20 and 28 says, he shed his blood to purchase the church. There are certain characteristics of John's account, the fourth account, and I would emphasize that to you as you're reading through the book. John stresses the deity, the Godhood, the Godhood of Jesus. Notice what he does. I mentioned at the beginning of this that John is sort of like a, an attorney in court bringing his witnesses before the court to establish his premise, which, of course, is that uh, Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Word that became flesh. And he introduces six, no less than six witnesses, that's beside himself, who affirm the deity of Jesus. First of all, John the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ, is a witness to that, chapter 1, verse 34. Then 
he calls Nathaniel. Nathaniel is a witness in chapter 1, verse 49. And then he calls Peter, Apostle Peter, chapter 6, verse 69. And then he calls Martha, chapter 11, verse 27. Following that, he calls Thomas in chapter 20 and verse 28. And then John himself in John chapter 20, verse 31. And then Christ in chapter 10, verse 36. Now, these are the credible witnesses that he calls to the witness stand. Now, if anybody is going to say that their testimony doesn't make any difference, they're going to have to prove they're not credible witnesses. Uh, the Apostle John also reports seven, seven miraculous signs which establish Christ's lordship over all aspects of life. Now, Mark really gets into that, and we didn't bring all of that out, but we mentioned how Mark to the Roman mind emphasized the power of Christ. But it's done also by John because Christ has power over all things. And as you read through the New Testament, you'll see that that's brought out by Paul himself, uh, whom he hath made heir of all things and all these kind of things. Uh, to the Colossians, by whom also he made the world. And uh, he makes it clear that he's the only potentate, king of kings, lord of lords. Over and over again, he is above and beyond all. And even the Father has delegated to the Son all authority. That at the end of the world, then of course he will deliver up, according to 1 Corinthians 15, his authority back to God. That's the reason I point out that while we live in the flesh on earth in a probationary period uh, designed to prove our love for God by our obedience to him and our faith in him by our compliance with his will, that how we know God now uh, may be different from how we know him when there's no longer a probationary state, when this world and all things material and pertaining to time is no more. And there's no more sin. There's no more possibility of death because sin's destroyed. And that's the last enemy, enemy that Christ puts down and destroys is death. And thus uh, we are going to have at the resurrection the body like Christ presently has. So how we will understand deity in that period, I don't know. It's just that things will not be certainly as they are now because we primarily know God and all things pertaining to spiritual things from the standpoint of um, fighting fight of faith and of being faithful, steadfast, unmovable, always bounding the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord, First Corinthians 15, 58. In addition to stressing the deity of Christ, John stresses his humanity. I, I've also mentioned that. There's no way to study about Christ and not emphasize that he is God, but at the same time emphasize that he is man. This is what makes him unique. There is no other being like the second person of the Godhead. He is truly God and all that God is, but he's truly man and all that man is. When Christ became flesh, when he became a human being like we are, he forever remains a human being, though albeit he is a glorified human being glorified humanity as i said many times john says we do not know what we shall be like but we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is then paul said to timothy that there's one mediator between god and man and he says it the man jesus christ and that ought to begin to tell us even more how much he loves us 
that once he became a man, he is forever a man. Now, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. That didn't mean he ceased to be man. The scriptures are clear that he remains glorified man. The first fruits, in other words, as spiritual members of the church who die faithful in the resurrection, will follow right on in the resurrection as he is. That's one of the great blessings and hopes that we have is to possess a body even that the Lord possesses. So talking about radical changes that my mind can't grasp, that certainly lets us know there's going to be a difference. So the deity of Christ is stressed, as is his humanity. And again, notice how many times you'll have things said about the humanity of Christ. John will report that Jesus became weary in chapter 4, verse 6. He tells about Christ becoming thirsty. He even tells about him becoming impatient in chapter 6, verse 26. Which also tells me a person can become impatient and not sin against God. How do I know that? Well, Christ did. And he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Um, it says he was wistful, chapter 6, verse 67. He was severe, chapter 8, verse 44. He was a man of sorrows. He was sorrowful, chapter 11, verse 35. He was appreciative, chapter 12, and verse 7. And the scripture says he was even troubled, chapter 12, verse 27. He was loving as a human can be loving, chapter 13, verse 1. He was loyal, chapter 18, verse 8. And he was courageous, chapter 18, verse 23. So I suggest when you begin to study yourself, then look to Jesus, who is as much man or human, as you are or I am, or anybody else, and see that he evidences the characteristics of humanity. John uses a lot of symbolism in his writing. In fact, he uses more symbols for Christ than any of the other writers. Notice how he'll talk about him as the Word, the Lamb of God, the bread of life, the door, the true vine, and so on. You can add more to that. He talks about the living water, and so on. Now, as the book is put together or as it's constructed, and I don't know whether you've noticed this or not, but John makes constant use of symbolic numbers. And those numbers are three, three, and seven. Three and seven. Now, when you get over into the apocalyptic, figurative, symbolic language of the book of Revelation, you'll see how those numbers are even uh, more used by John. We look at numbers simply for their numerical value, but the ancients didn't all the time. Those numbers carried ideas with them. And that's important, and we won't try to get into all that now. Maybe sometime we'll study the apocalyptic language of the book of Revelation because it's anchored in uh, Jewish apocalyptics, which would be found in Daniel and Ezekiel and so forth. But anyway, he does use those two, those two numbers, three and seven. Notice, let's do it this way as examples. Jesus is three times in Galilee. He's three times in Judea. There are three Passovers that help date the book 
he records, that is John does, he records three miracles in Galilee and Judea. And he reports three sayings on the cross. And then there are three appearances following the resurrection. As far as the number seven, there are seven I am statements. There are seven witnesses to Jesus' deity, and there are seven signs. Now, I'll jump over here real quickly and uh, point out to you that as John writes and Jesus threw him to those churches in Asia, how many churches of Asia? Well, there's seven, aren't there? Seven, usually in apocalyptic language, meant complete. We'll talk more about that, as I said, maybe later on. Because you know, by the way, that when you start Revelation and read about the seven churches of Asia, there were a whole lot more congregations than those seven churches. But that's another story. He wrote, since the Holy Spirit guided him, systematically, he had a plan to his writing. But it's the only one of the gospel accounts that's uh, really arranged like it is. You ought to read these things when you don't have anything else to distract you. So you can think about what you're reading. Of course, you don't do that with any part of the Bible. But, but you'll see these uh, that I'm about to give you more if you'll do that. He gives, speaking of John, he gives minute details in his narratives. Uh, just for example, get, get a pencil and pad or something. And go to his dealings with the Samaritan woman in John 4, 5 through 9 and verse 35. And just jot down the details that are recorded by John about that matter. He is very selective in his choice of materials to... Uh, how would you say it? I guess achieve to reach his announced goal that we brought out several times already, which is John chapter 20, 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Uh, notice how he follows through and setting that out. But at the same time, there are significant omissions in the book of John. You don't have any genealogy of Jesus Christ. You don't have an account of the birth of Christ. Uh, there's not a thing said about the Christ as a young person in his youth. There's not anything said about the temptation of Christ. Uh, he doesn't say a thing about the transfiguration. He doesn't write about the appointment of the apostles. There's no parables, no parables in the book of John. And there's nothing about the ascension or the Great Commission, as it is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, since he, uh, John, of course, presents Christ as preeminently deity, think for a minute. Such points as I've just mentioned are not relevant to his goal. The point is, he doesn't do like a lot of us and run off chasing things. He stays right with his goal and he deals specifically with what's relevant to his goal, what's necessary, what it involves, and he doesn't add to it or take away from it. John relates 20 
seven, 27 interviews of Jesus with different people. He presents more long discourses of Jesus than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. John centers his narrative around Jesus' visits to Jerusalem to attend the various feasts that were peculiar to the law of Moses and tradition of the Jews. Uh, the first Passover is chapter 2, verse 23. Then there's a feast that uh, is not named as to what it was in chapter 5, verse 1. Then there's the Feast of Tabernacles, chapter 7, verse 2. And the Feast of Dedication, chapter 10, verse 22. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, the last Passover. Now let's look a little bit more at John and the synoptic gospel accounts. We'll be repeating ourselves here a little bit from what we've already said. You'll remember that Matthew presents Christ as the Jewish Messiah. And then when we turn to Mark, we find him presenting the ministry and the work of Christ, specifically for the Latin-speaking world of the Romans. And Luke stresses the character, the character of the Son of Man and Savior. He does that for the Greek-speaking world. John, though, emphasizes Christ's divine origin, his divine person and the meaning of only begotten Son of God. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but over the years, people have attacked, such as John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. They've attacked that terminology and said it is wrong to apply it to Jesus. Um, the Greek word is monogenes. It means that while we are all brothers and sisters in the family of God and thus sons and daughters of God, Christ is unique, and we've been emphasizing some of that. To me, I don't understand why people can't think and read their Bibles and understand it at all, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, understand that Christ is quite unique. He's he's man as much as man can be man and God as much as God can be God. Now, who, who else is like that? So he is one of a kind. I'm a child of God. If you're a Christian, you're a child of God, a member of the family of God, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. But we're not children of God like Christ is a son of God. So I deliberately... I don't know whether you've noticed it in my preaching. I deliberately will use the term only begotten son as much as I can. And uh, I think it's just the appropriate term to describe Christ for what he is because there's nobody else like him. Nobody. Tell me, well, you read the writer of Hebrews and he talks about how he's so much higher than the angels and how he's, no angel was ever dealt with by the Father like Jesus was. Uh, if you read the very first chapter of Hebrews, you see how that Christ is exalted because of who he is. So when these people get off on something like that, I, I can't figure out why they do. But nevertheless, he is the only begotten son of God. John is the only one to report the early Judean ministry of Christ. 
the synoptic books leave the impression of a shorter ministry for Christ of only one, one half, one, one half years. With John's information, this is why we can determine that it was three, three and a half years. That's why I say all of the time, and it's not just me, but you cannot get the picture God wants you to get of Jesus Christ without reading and understanding Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It doesn't mean that Matthew alone can't convince somebody that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Same be true of Mark, standing alone, or Luke, or John. But you do not get the complete picture of Jesus Christ and his ministry without all four of them put together. The three synoptic books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have much material in common. Now watch this. Only eight, not 80, but 8% of John's information is repeated by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Only 8%. Thus, a great deal of what we know of Jesus is from the book of John. I, I don't know whether you remember, but many, many years ago, one of those movies in Hollywood that was made about, about Christ, and many of them aren't much. But this goes back to this, I don't know when, 60s or 70s, somewhere back in there. And they used John. And of course, you've got professional people knowing how to write uh, screenplays and all that stuff, not dummies. And they said that the book of John was written more like a screenplay than some screenplays <laughs> because of the way John is selecting. Of course, the Holy Spirit's involved in all of it is selecting these various accounts of witnesses and evidence and setting them out. I always thought that was interesting, probably coming from people that have not much knowledge of anything but Hollywood. John uh, relates none, I think I said this earlier, of the parables that are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke but reports many long discourses which the others omit. Five of the eight miracles recorded in John are peculiar to John. They're not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For example, turning the water into wine, healing the nobleman's son, Healing the paralytic of um, the town of Bethsaida. Healing the blind man at Siloam. Raising Lazarus. And then the miraculous catch of fishes. And each miracle that John notes, notice, reflects the power of Christ's word there's the emphasis john often ties the miracle to a lesson which jesus taught here's another example the feeding of the five thousand is followed by the sermon on the bread of life john 6 verses 1 through 59 and John is far more definite than Matthew, Mark, and Luke in indicating the exact time and place of the events that he deals with. I found it interesting that the word Jew, J-E-W, Jew, is used over 60 times in John but never more than twice in the synoptic works. John only tells us for about 20 days. Did you get that? Only about 20 days 
in the ministry of our Lord. Chapters 13 through 19 cover one single day of Jesus' life. And that is 237 verses out of 879. That's a third of the whole book. Chapter 21 seems to be, and uh, lack of a better way to put it, an appendix or epilogue added by John, maybe after he wrote the other part of it, most of it. Uh, it seems to be, and I'm saying seems to be, I wouldn't be dogmatic on it, that it was done to correct an error which had spread concerning himself, that he would live till Jesus returned. Just notice how he does that in chapter 21, verses 21 through 23. 21 verses 21 through 23. And of course, we've mentioned this several times, the primary message of the book ends in chapter 20 and verse 31. Well, our time has just about come to an end for tonight. We'll look at some things that some of the so-called church fathers had to say about it our next time together. And... Uh, We'll spend a little time on some word studies used, of the words used by John in his vocabulary. Uh, let's keep in mind that the word is a vehicle of thought. A word is a sign of an idea. And that's very important when it comes to God giving us his will and his own particular signs of ideas that the Holy Spirit revealed through the inspired writers. So we'll take a look at that. That also will help us maybe in understanding the value of word studies when it comes to studying the, the Bible. Several other things that are peculiar that are, I think, are interesting that help us see more in not only what we've already studied, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but then especially about John because of how he wrote and why he wrote. But again, let me stop here by saying you will not get the complete picture unless you read, meditate on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, we'll call her quits right now.